Good evening, everyone. Thank you for um, coming out tonight. Um, I know you're all hardy uh, Vermonters, I assume, so um, no worries about coming out on a relatively cold November night in the dark. I'm being told that you can't hear me. We do like. How about that? Oh. So uh, my name is Chip Confest. I'm the um, co-chair, along with Laura Sevilla, of the um, Rural Economic Development Working Group. We're the ones hosting this um, uh, hearing tonight. I'm glad to see all of you here. I was just going to say there, if we have more people than chairs, um, just please help yourself to the chairs there in the back there. You can sit at any of the tables um, or just pull the chairs down. Um, we're going to get started here um, pretty quickly. Um, I just wanted to make a couple of thank yous. One um, to um, Mitzi Johnson, who wasn't able to come tonight as Speaker of the House, but she has been a, a very supportive uh, in, in, for our group in um, allowing us to do these hearings um, uh, and really just being generally supportive of uh, rural economic issues in general and um, helping us move forward with some of the legislation that we've proposed over the past year. So. Um, a thanks to her, um, and a thanks to you all um, for coming out. I know it's, um, you know, it's, uh, we've tried to figure out what, what a good time of year to do this would be, um, and I know there's always uh, challenges for everybody with um, busy schedules, but um, I really appreciate the fact that you all made time to come and talk to us. So um, if you haven't been to one of these hearings before, um, you're going to come, we'll call your name, uh, and I'll also say who's um, next in line. Come up and sit at the table. We have a microphone up here for you to use. Um, and uh, we have four minute time limit um, for now. Um, Peter's gonna give you a, a sign when it's time, uh, when your four minutes is up. Um, and if you're unable to get all of what you wanted to say um, done in that four minutes, we would encourage you um, to email us your testimony. Actually, we'd encourage you to email us email us your testimony if you have it in that form anyway. Um, the place to email it is to Charlie Kimball, and so like everyone else, everyone else's um, ledge email, it's ckimball at ledge.state.vt.us. You can find that on the legislative webpage if you don't remember it. Um, so again, please um, email us anything you want us to um, be looking at, and we'll share it among the entire group. And, as we said in our announcement, you know, this is really what, th this hearing is one of the things that's gonna really guide our work in the legislature around these um, economic development issues uh, for this upcoming session. So please send us all of your thoughts. Um, in a minute, I'm gonna ask um, folks around the table to introduce themselves. We actually have a, a really significant number of people um, in the Rural Economic Development Working Group, as we call ourselves, um, there's close to 30 of us. Um, not everybody was able to make it tonight, but um, I'll have the people that are up here introduce themselves. Um, and is there anything else I needed to say? All right. Um, so with that, I think we'll get started. So just, just a reminder, when I call your name, please come up, use the microphone, um, and I'll also let, uh, let you know who's up, uh, following that person. <coughs> so you want to? Introduce yourself and we'll work our way around the table. Okay, uh, I'm Scott Campbell. I'm a representative from St. Johnsbury. Anything else you put say? What well, committee are you? Oh, and I'm on Energy and Technology Committee. Uh, Peter Conlon from Cornwall, and I'm on the House Education Committee. Hi, I'm Sarah Coffey. I'm from Guilford, and I um, sit on House Corrections and Institutions. As I said, Chip Conquest, I'm actually from Wells River, Vermont, and represent Newbury, Groton, and Topsom, and I'm on the Appropriations Committee. Laura Sibelia from Dover, and I'm on the Energy and Technology Committee. Kelly Payala from Londonderry. I represent Londonderry, Weston, Jamaica, Stratton, and Windhall, and I sit on the Human Services Committee. Uh, Randall Zott, I represent uh, Barnard, Pomfret, Queech, and West Hartford. I'm on the House General. I'm Lucy Rogers from Waterville. I also represent Cambridge, and I'm on House Health Care. We have a, another member out here. And hi, I'm Emily Sennheiser. Okay. I'm from Rossboro, and I'm on the Commerce and Economic Development. Yeah. 
Um, and I think uh, Sandy Haas is somewhere in, oh, right there in mm -hmm. front of me. Sandy yeah. Haas from Rochester, um, also representing Bethel Stockbridge and Pittsfield, and I serve on Human Services. I think that's the only member in the audience. Mm -hmm. And would the Lieutenant Governor like to introduce himself? <laughs> <laughs> I'm David Zuckerman, Lieutenant Governor. I have a farm and am uh, passionate about our rural economy, so I was curious to hear your thoughts. And, yeah. and thank uh, you for coming to the hearing. And I think Representative from Sanders' office is also here. Okay. And Lady's office. <laughs> and Lady's office? Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, I think. Polly's <laughs> here. Oh, thanks. All right, so. Um, yeah, so we have Alan Robertson up first and Kathleen Warner um, after them. Oh, sorry. Great. Dangerous, first person. <coughs> My name is Al Robertson. I'm a woodland owner in Sheffield, Vermont. Um, I'm secretary of Vermont Woodlands Association and also somewhat responsible for helping with policy in VWA, uh, our organization. Uh, you should all have my uh, testimony already. It was emailed to Mr. Kimball several days ago. Uh, so to paraphrase, uh, you're going to read when you read the testimony that we feel there are a lot of new ideas and technologies that are available to improve the wood products industry and forestry in Vermont. Um, we have reservations about whether any of that would ever happen um, because um, of Act 250. Uh, we, we feel strongly that Act 250 has been very, very uh, good to Vermont in making, keeping its rural and forestry environment. But unfortunately, the last few years, some of the very things that have been good for Act 250 and keeping development under control have also stymied development of the forest products industry. Um, one of the things you'll see in the package is a, uh, a handout from the Eckley Sawmill in Germany. It represents a very, very small micro plant that produces power and also uses waste heat to heat the local community. Um, that's typical of the kind of things that you'll see in our, our submission that included cross-laminated timber, um, biochar, uh, increasing use of biofuels, and combined heat and power facilities. But again, um, there have been numerous attempts to fix Act 250 over the past few years, um, and yet it's never happened. There are, there are, and I say fix because we don't want to disturb what works. What we want to see is the same respect for the forest products industry as we see for agriculture. Um, right now, if you a farmer builds a barn, he doesn't have to go through Act 250. But if a sawmill needs to expand, or if a new sawmill wants to come into, into existence, uh, sometimes the hurdles are just so overwhelming that it just doesn't get done. Same thing with energy facilities. So there are, there are things that need to happen in Act 250 to make it better for the forest products industry. And we were hoping um, that that would be something that your, your uh, group would, would be looking at. Specifically, there are two bills right now in front of the legislature, uh, S-104 and H-197. You'll probably hear about those later tonight. Uh, that do a lot to resolving the issues that we've identified in our testimony. And with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. So Kathleen Wander and Brian Sheldon. Hello. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. Um, I'm Kathleen Wander, Executive Director of Vermont Woodlands Association and Vermont Tree Farm. I am uh, also a member of the Working Lands Board as a woodland owner and tree farmer representing woodland owners. Um, but Vermont Woodlands is a member of the Working Lands Coalition. And I feel like I need to say that I'm speaking for the coalition side tonight, not for the board. Um, and so um, I've been involved with the Working Lands Initiative since 2012 when it first came to the House Ag Committee which is now the House Ag and Forestry Committee, um, after a wonderful change of focus that included forestry. Um, I guess nobody here tonight is from House Ag and Forestry, but, uh, but I know I have friends there. Um, <laughs> Representative Partridge uh, would have been there. Uh -huh. okay. Thank you. Um, so it, this was really uh, Working Lands Enterprise Initiative was a cutting edge proposal 
when it came to the legislature. It was designed to assist businesses that rely on the working landscape of farms and forests. Um, I've actually been asked to present information about Working Lands Enterprise Initiative in other states and at a, a national conference. It really is a flagship program that Vermont developed that signals a willingness to invest in economic development across the working landscape. Each year, the coalition comes to the legislature with asks for additional funding uh, because we know what a difference it makes to have that funding on the ground. The grant requests every year overwhelm our capacity, and so we often need to turn down good proposals. Now we know that the, that the working group supports the, the Working Lands Initiative, and wouldn't it be amazing if it were funded at $3 million annually and we didn't have to fight for that year after year? That would just make such a difference. It would foster so much innovation and diversification across <laughs> businesses that would lead to market and supply chain impacts for farm and forest enterprises. Now this program has really been the best rural economic driver for working lands businesses throughout the state. And it can continue to drive the rural economy if adequately funded. Now, I, and I know I'm often preaching to the choir. You know, we do that a lot in forestry. Um, but it is, it's just important for me to underscore how critical these investments are for forestry and wood products businesses. We are really counting on this continued investment in working lands businesses that keep our forests working. Um, and just uh, when you come up to testify, um, unfortunately, you have to hold the mic sort of right in front of your mouth in order for everybody to be able to hear. So please do that. So um, I'm Mike Greenville. You really do need that. I guess right up, right, right up, right up. Right up. Okay, we got you. So um, I'm a resident of Lincoln, uh, and I'm the owner of Maple Landmark Woodcraft, which is a woodworking business in Middlebury. Uh, we craft small wood products. Uh, business I started 40 years ago. Uh, we currently have, uh, we employ 39 people. Uh, and I appreciate the attention uh, that is put to the, to the working lands economy. I sat on the Working Lands Enterprise Board in its first two years of existence. Got to be one of the people who kind of help break in that process, which is arduous. Uh, I, I wish I had some bright ideas, brilliant ideas for you. Uh, I, ha I have a, just a few points I'd like to make. Uh, first is about the Working Lands uh, Fund. Uh, I've always been bothered when, when I was on the board and, and sense that uh, it seems that the there's a lot of overhead that goes into running that. and which is, it doesn't bother me about the overhead. It bothers me that uh, there's a lot of capacity. If there was more money to, to give, it wouldn't cost any more to give it out. Um, it'd be a more efficient use of funds. So the extra money you put in can go right out. And I don't know, I didn't explain that very well, but, uh, but I think you get it. Also, perhaps a more flexible schedule for awarding the funds. Uh, business happens fast and quick, and opportunities come and go, and the annual schedule of things just seems that uh, it makes it difficult. Uh, applications are only taken once a year. It takes four to six months for the money to be awarded. Uh, there's a lot of time delay in that. Uh, for me, as to my business, I'm just going to offer a, an anecdote uh, to, to kind of call attention to concern is uh, that I've always been proud of my business and dealing as local as possible. And uh, I've always focused in having a, a short supply chain. And I've been fortunate that uh, the lumber that I buy, and I buy 125,000 board feet a year, so it's not a huge amount, but it's no small amount. Uh, it comes from local mills. Uh, we offer health insurance. We ha offer Vermont Health Connect plans. And our premium increase for 2020 is $27,000, uh, primarily because of cost shifts. I already spend more money on health insurance than I do on lumber. Uh, 
I, what am I to do when I don't have both $27,000 and a cost of living pay increase floating around in my back pocket? Last week I took delivery of a trailer load of lumber from Maine. That lo load of lumber saved me $6,000. So uh, instead of uh, $18,000 worth of money to Vermont Mills, I, pay, I sent $12,000 to Maine. That bothers me a great deal, but I have to maintain my business. Uh, so it, you know, I, I don't have a brilliant thing there, but the, the, this cost shift in the health insurance is just crazy. Um, and uh, it's, it's unsustainable. It's unsustainable years ago, and it's just worse now. So. Um, that's, that's primarily what I have to say. Um, I would like to be sure that you spend time on good legislation, not soundbite legislation. Be sure that it's funded so, thing, so there's proper guidance, compliance, and enforcement. I'm involved in several uh, bits of legislation that don't have that, and it makes it real difficult to do business. So, thanks. Good evening, folks. Uh, so my name is Jordan Giacconi. I'm the uh, new public policy manager for Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. This is my uh, seventh day on the job, but it's a real pleasure being here. I certainly appreciate uh, the opportunity to testify. Um, so as many of you know, VBSR is a business association with close to 750 members who advocate for policy. Oops, sorry. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, VBSR is a business association with close to 750 members who advocate for policies that support workers, communities, um, and the environment. So really advocating around a triple bottom line of people, planet, and prosperity. Uh, we have members of every business size um, in every Vermont industry and sec sector represented and also represent um, industries from every county in the state of Vermont. Um, as of 2019, more than half of our members represent small businesses employing fewer than 50 full-time employees and about a third of our members represent uh, businesses retaining less than 20 full-time employees as well. Many of our rural businesses that VBSR represents are interested in climate action, uh, not just as a moral imper imperative, but also as an economic development opportunity. Investments in weatherization, efficiency in electric vehicle infrastructure, and divestment from import imported fossil fuels would yield significant benefits for rural and low-income Vermonters, as well as ratepayers writ large. Uh, from winter recreation and local food production, to our drink-driven and tourism economies. Uh, climate change represents a very significant threat to the Vermont brand, way of life, and rural economies. Um, so with that, I want to thank you all for the opportunity uh, to testify and for all the important work you're doing to support our rural economies. Um, and we'll encourage you moving forward um, to continue to engage in advancing uh, key legislation like, such as the Global Warming Solutions Act, um, but also uh, turn your attention as well to the, in, the uh, forthcoming Transportation Climate Initiative to ensure that these rural communities are represented fairly and that um, we don't leave folks in the lurch as we move forward um, toward a greener, uh, more climate-friendly future for the state of Vermont. Uh, so again, thank you all. I look forward to working with you and wish everyone a good night. So I just want to say, first of all, good evening, everyone. Um, hi, folks. Uh, it's great that we're all here. My name is Nick Richardson. I'm the president and CEO at the Vermont Land Trust. I've been in that role for about two years. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here with the Rural Caucus this evening. Um, you are our people. And we are deeply connected to rural lands and working lands all across the state. We have relationships with 2,000 parcels and about 1,800 landowners who are farmers, foresters, um, working these lands, storing them on behalf of all of us. And so it's a real pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, I do have a couple of points I want to emphasize in the legislative session to come, but um, because we hardly ever look back and say thank you for the work that's come before, I just want to commend the caucus on the work you did last year. Um, you know, particularly the uh, expansion of funding for the Working Lands Enterprise Board um, Kathleen Wanner spoke, I think, really eloquently to, to that. Um, it's an important pillar of how we support the working landscape and our rural communities in this state. And it, it is a very innovative program. And uh, along with a very strong uh, support for conservation, low-income housing, um, you know, and, and other key programs that really invest in rural communities, it's a part of what, what makes Vermont work. And I think it's a really important program. <coughs> Uh, the regulatory relief was also, I think, really critical, and um, you know, it's been has been described around uh, supporting 
uh, common sense changes that will allow businesses to stay in business. Um, our working landscape really needs that right now. Uh, and I'll say that for the Vermont Land Trust, uh, which has conserved 11% of the land in Vermont, 2,000 parcels, almost 700,000 acres over the last 42 years, uh, we're recognizing right, that as important as that is, we need to be doing more in order to make this working landscape work and our communities work and so we're asking the question, what does Vermont need from us today? Um, and the answer to that is different than it was 30 years ago. And it's about getting the next generation of farmers onto land in Vermont. Um, we've done 100 farmland access projects over the last 10 years, working with, in fact, with many folks uh, in the room um, who are you know, great farmers who are connecting with their communities, investing in our rural economies. Uh, we want to expand that work going forward over the next 10 years to get 200 to 300 new and beginning farmers onto land in Vermont. Uh, you know, we're working with landowners to participate in forest carbon offset projects, and there's, a, there's been a great working group that's been working um, throughout the course of this last summer and fall to deliver some recommendations around that for policy changes and also just what are the things we can do as a state to promote uh, access to forest carbon and forest carbon offsets for more landowners. That's something that we would really support and appreciate uh, going forward. Uh, this state needs more from us than from all of us than it's ever than, it, than it's ever needed, um, and these working landscapes that we participate in, um, that are such an important part of how we how we feel about this state, uh, the connections that we have here, the community that we have here, they're really under threat, um, and I think it's important um, for all of us to be thinking outside of the box about what it is that we can be doing to support our rural landscapes. Uh, the Vermont Land Trust is here; we're all in. Um, and we're gonna be looking very creatively at new ways to participate, and we really appreciate the Royal Caucus, the work that you're doing, um, and I wanna be a partner with you. Thank you so much. Hi, um, I'm Amanda Carlson, from, I'm the town administrator for the town of Coventry. Um, so on behalf of the small municipal towns, um, I, I know there's a lot of effective tools that the, uh, you've created for a local government to support the businesses, but that information doesn't always reach the small towns. These towns are dealing with one person and the select board member that's been there for 30 years, um, and they don't always um, share that information around. Uh, so to make sure that they, they understand what's available, I'd love to see um, state-supported or, or run uh, regional uh, workshops or, or meetings that would allow um, you know, some of that one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, for these towns to understand. Uh, to learn best practices for supporting local businesses and what they can do in their small communities. It's not always on a large scale. It's not always you know, the big projects. Sometimes it's those, those small ones that need the most help. Um, so for manufacturing, you know, are there case studies and, and you know, what funding is available and, and the permit process and where to start so that the municipality can um, assist uh, someone looking into that. And on um, outdoor recreation economy, um, understanding what uh, what's proven to work and uh, what are the pitfalls or what policies. We don't always need to recreate the wheel. It'd be nice to know kind of what is available. And also, uh, sometimes it's really hard to find out what funding's available because they're all available in different places. And you don't know and you have to just keep searching and, and hope somebody tells you which website or, or what agency to look at. It'd be nice to know where you can go for what funding and what's available to the small towns out there. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Jenna Kowalski. I'm the Community and Policy Manager with the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Um, I'm also the President of the Vermont Community Development Association Board, um, and I live in Huntington. Uh, so thank you for providing this forum. Uh, we, VCRD is a facilitator of public process. We facilitate conversations at the community level, and then we kind of add up what we're hearing in, in communities across the state, and we also facilitate statewide discussions as well. Um, on the community and economic development side, um, through our community visit program, we've worked with about 70 different towns around the state on facilitated discussions to um, invite the whole town together, line up what's most important, set priorities, and then help to connect to resources. And we also provide coaching and leadership training in support of that work. And I, I thought, and just uh, where we've worked in recent years, we've been in um, Montgomery, the four town region of Royalton, Sharon, Stratford, and Tunbridge, Greensboro, Pulteney, Westford, and now we're working in Rockingham and Wheelock. 
Um, I thought it might be helpful just to share, you know, when we work to towns, we don't know what's best for them, but we listen and we learn, you know, what are the issues they're grappling with today, and I thought it would be helpful just to share a few things we're hearing in every town we're working with. Um, we have communities lining up task forces around broadband and cell connection. Every town we're working with these days are setting those up. Uh, traffic, uh, streetscape, walkability, and bikeability, as well as trails and outdoor recreation. Um, most towns are setting up around some kind of economic development committee or even looking for funding to build staffing into their town structure to support economic development and uh, small businesses. Um, and then certainly in recent years, every town is prioritizing water and sewer infrastructure. Um, they come into the room thinking about housing and attracting young people and supporting businesses and realize that to do that they need the infrastructure um, to support that vision they have for their community. Um, so community leaders are working hard on these things all around the state, um, and, but it, you know, it's tough work and we see success where they're able to connect to resources and, te and technical assistance that they need. Um, and so there certainly have been some programs over the last couple of years that have supported many of those things I just listed and any support in those areas are critical. Um, on the state policy side, uh, we facilitate the Climate Economy Action Team, uh, a group of large and small businesses and organizations um, unified around the belief that Vermont can uh, be a leader in developing rural solutions to climate change. Their priorities this year will be around the Transportation Climate Initiative, um, around liberating efficiency utilities to kind of do their work where significant financial and greenhouse gas savings could be realized, so extending services from electric efficiency to thermal and transportation efficiencies. Um, SEAT, the Climate Economy Action Team, recognizes that uh, this could help to increase affordability and savings, especially in the most rural areas where residents shoulder a lot of, um, a much higher energy burden. Um, and then finally, uh, the Working Lands Initiative, uh, You've all heard a lot about the importance of the Working Lands Enterprise Fund. Uh, we uh, facilitate and convene the Working Lands Coalition. Um, and the coalition certainly thanks you all for your leadership uh, last year in authorizing uh, the largest investment in that fund to date uh, at over a one and a half million. Um, and the coalition believes that they'd love for that to kind of become the base funding for this work in an ongoing way and in fact increase that um, over time uh, with a goal of ultimately three million to meet the needs of businesses that are critical to protecting and promoting the future of Vermont's working landscape. Um, and of course, you've heard tonight all the ways that that can support and grow the rural economy as well. Um, so thanks so much for the time, I appreciate it, and um, I will submit this um, in writing as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna interrupt for just one second here because the last two speakers reminded me of things that I was gonna say when we started and forgot. Um, I've been doing this for 11 years and I still uh, get tongue-tied in front of a crowd of people. Um, so uh, this earlier this year, um, our group took um, a bus tour of uh, southern Vermont in order to do the same kind of thing, uh, a listening tour um, that uh, Sarah organized. And it was a great thing. It was the first time that we've done it. Um, and one of the things that we came out of it with is wow, this is really great, we need to do this more, we need to keep doing, getting out to other parts of the state because I know not everybody can make it to Montpelier on the night when we have the hearing. So um, we, probably, we won't do another one this year, but next year you know, maybe we'll show up in your neck of the woods. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was um, B BCRD um, that Janet is, uh, works for um, has been very helpful in helping us get the announcement out and I forgot to thank them for that um, when I started, so I really do want to extend our thanks to them. Hi, I'm Bruce Hennessy, uh, Maple Wind Farm in Huntington, Richmond, and Bolton, Vermont. Um, <coughs> running that with my partner, Beth. Uh, <coughs> we produce 100% grass-fed beef, pasture-raised pork, poultry, um, and eggs from poultry, of course, and uh, run a small USDA poultry processing plant that was <coughs> funded in part by several uh, Working Lands Enterprise grants. Um, we feel like we're the poster children for uh, working lands. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of support from, from that organization and from uh, partners with that organization, Vermont Land Trust, uh, 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 <coughs> Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and NRCS, I know works in there. So uh, we've, we've taken full advantage of those. And somehow we've gotten the word, maybe because uh, <coughs> we've uh, been the squeaky wheel asking for help for all these things. So 
Uh, I'm here in support of working lands, in support of, of, of increasing that investment, and and also to to ask uh, the, the the group to consider adding uh, payment for ecosystem services into the mix. Um, you know, when when Beth and I first got started, we. We thought it would be enough that if we worked really hard, we had a good resource base, um, if we were reasonably intelligent and diligent, um, that, that the business would just be successful. And the truth is, is that you can be all of those things and uh, it still won't work out. You still need support. There's a tremendous amount of barriers between uh, small agriculture and profitability. And even though working lands has been a big part in helping us solve those problems, um, we need to go further uh, for us to stay in business. <clears throat> I was uh, encouraged to hear that the gentleman in Wood, Wood Products was able to pay health insurance for his employees. We're not able to pay health insurance for our employees. And um, that's a major problem for them, and it doesn't feel good for us either. It's very hard to even pay well, some would consider a living wage and others would consider not a living wage, at least in Chittenden County, right? Um, so I will, I, I want to tell, tell a story at the end. The last thing that we received through Working Lands was a 50% grant to attend uh, the Ranching for Profit. We like to call it Farming for Profit, but officially it's called Ranching for Profit. Um, that a number of Vermont farms were, um, were able to attend last year. And that is an ongoing and continuing um, program for us. Uh, it's a seven day farm business boot camp, essentially. That's the initial course. And then you have an opportunity to, to continue on in a board of farmers from across the nation and uh, continue to, to uh, work on your business and develop and uh, realize uh, many, many of the things that we need to do to, to be profitable and also build soils and uh, add to the health and welfare of our community. Um, and I just want to encourage a real focus on those really long-reaching and far-reaching programs for the Working Lands Group. Um, to help farmers really go beyond just that hard work and core intelligence to true financial literacy and the ability to, uh, to become viable farm operations. And uh, again, a deep thanks to all of you for, for that opportunity. Good evening. I'm Christine McGowan from the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, and I coordinate the Vermont Forest Industry Network. The network was established in 2018 to help support and strengthen our state's forest and wood product sector, and now includes more than 150 people and organizations involved in Vermont's forest and wood products industry. I'd like to start by thanking you for your support of the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. The Vermont Forest Industry Network's creation was a direct result of research commissioned by the Working Lands Enterprise Board's Forestry Committee back in 2015 and in the years since has increased awareness about the value of our forest and wood products industry to Vermont and has embarked on several projects to expand or create new products for forest products, new markets for forest, forest products and wood products. A few facts about our forests. Vermont is 76% forested and 80% of those forests are privately held by small family woodlot owners. Historic land use patterns have left us with a considerable challenge. After depleting most of our forests for more than, more than 100 years ago, much of what has grown back has not been well tended. So in a typical Vermont timber harvest, <clears throat> as much as three quarters of what is removed is considered low grade, translate low value. Up until recently, that low grade wood had a healthy regional market in pulp used to make paper. But for a variety of reasons, one of which is probably within arm's length of everyone in this room, We've seen a sharp decline in pulp mills in our region, and that's had a ripple effect on the entire supply chain. Two years ago, several Vermont loggers were stuck with wood they couldn't sell and expensive equipment they could no longer afford. Many of them parked their skidders and were forced to find other ways to make a living. 
Meanwhile, most of the sawmills that used to be economic drivers in so many of our rural towns have disappeared. Some couldn't compete with newer, bigger mills across the border in Canada. Others have struggled with the constraints placed on them by state regulations. Those that remain are faced with the reality that their owners are not getting any younger, but their younger successors are few and far between. So when a sawmill closes its doors, it's unlikely we will ever get that infrastructure back. Despite these challenges, Vermont's forest and wood products industry still represents a significant economic driver in our state, generating $1.4 billion in economic activity and providing 10,500 Vermont jobs. When you add forest-based recreation to the mix, you add another 10,000 jobs and 1.9 billion in economic activity. Take our wood heat sector. When Vermonters heat with wood, 78 cents of every dollar is retained in the local economy. Compare that to only 22 cents retained when we use fossil fuels like heating oil and propane. Some people worry that increasing the use of wood heat means we'll cut down too many trees. But the fact is, we're harvesting less than half the net growth in our forests. The reality is, Vermont is losing more than 2,000 acres of forest land per year to rural and suburban development, not forest products. Some worry that wood heat is bad for our climate. Yet a recent life cycle analysis of pellets made and used in the northern forest region shows that from day one, using wood pellets for heat reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 54% compared to oil and 59% 59, and 